A very good evening and a warm welcome to Personal Finance. I'm Kukule Tukele. Now today we're joined by a phenomenal financial planner in the South African and African sphere, Mr. Gerald Mwandiambira, who's a certified financial planner and with the Sugar Creek Wealth, to talk to us about the key financial planning principles that consumers like you and I can learn from his latest book called My Money. It's phenomenal principles that come through here and takes us on a journey as well throughout your life story from you being a young boy uh, who grew up in Zimbabwe, went to one of the top private schools to uh, financial lessons that you learned throughout your life. But Gerald, let's start with the inspiration firstly behind the book and um, why do South Africans and Africans across the globe need to know more about this uh, issue regarding money that uh, no one can ever really form that mountain of wealth, right? Thank you, Gugu, for the <laughs> wonderful introduction. But I think the reason why I wrote the book was simply because I have walked the path. Mm -hmm. I have walked that path of African boy dreaming of the world, traveling the world and making all the financial mistakes and finally doing a bit right by actually being in a profession which allows me to actually know the tools. So to me, it was really one of those journeys where I was doing a bit of self introspection while at the same time giving simple plain tips on my own personal experiences around money management because as Africans, for many of us, we've just moved away from our cultural environment where wealth was stored in cattle and grain mm. to the modern, you know, Western wealth values. And we simply were not taught those. So to me, this is just a step in terms of helping my peers and anyone out there in Africa to basically read and, and learn about money. Mm. And it's from a very personal perspective, and maybe it's best we start from the beginning where, as a child, the introduction to money. I know these days I have nieces and nephews who think that money is that endless supply that comes from that card that you continuously swipe, swipe or you go to that ATM machine and get a couple of uh, notes out, but there's a never-ending supply. But I take it that's the first principle, perhaps, that we need to take away from the book. Essentially, yes, because I think we've made money an intangible. It's become just an invisible transaction. And for children, it's important that they still hold and feel the notes and the coins and assign values to things. And you can start by taking your little one into the supermarket and saying, here's money, go buy bread. How much change should you get? So not only is the child learning about exchanging mm. of value, they're also doing a bit of maths training as well. So to me, that's the first thing. You need to start young and it's a journey. You basically grow up and you need to appreciate and respect money. Our problem as most Africans is that we've lost respect for money because it's become an electronic transaction. So the brown coins, we throw them away, we give them to anybody, we don't respect money. Now, if you cannot respect the smallest denomination of money you have in your hands, you'll never really accumulate wealth. Yeah, what do they say? Take care of the pennies and the, 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 the dollars the, the, and the, yes, the exactly. rands will take care of themselves? Essentially, those brown, no, those brown coins, find a way to recycle them, put them in a jar, do something with them, but do not disrespect them by simply throwing them away. Because even the greatest billionaire in the world will tell you that a dollar starts with one cent. Exactly. Gerald, if we do take a look at the progress of the book, it certainly does cover a lot of uh, lifetime experiences, kind of contracts, saving up for marriage as well as growing up and uh, covering death, uh, those kind of scenarios. Mm. But so having started off with this child who grows up, so often parents are overwhelmed by the uh, amount of products that are available on the market to save for their children, whether it's their health care or their education. Uh, where does one all start in sourcing this information and perhaps uh, highlight for us as well the importance of a financial planner in this regard? I think a financial planner is as important as a medical doctor. And I think that's the one thing I wanted any reader to get out of this book that money is a specialized skill mm. hence if you read it you see oh my gosh there's so much stuff because someone has to train and learn all these things so you're not expected to know everything but where you have lacks and gaps in knowledge go and find a professional to uh, to help you to make the financial decisions you ought to be making I and as a, and as a parent you're doubly challenged because you've got children watching you Mm. What about the misconceptions, though, that financial planners are just there to push products, come at a very high cost, uh, uh, and might not necessarily be able to meet my needs efficiently? In the past, there were these guys called financial advisors and salespeople who were ex-car salesmen or ex-pharma who just decides, let me put on a suit and sell product. Mm -hmm. That's the past. Now, because of regulation 
and advancements in the industry, it's now a very much recognized profession in its own right. So financial planning professionals have that recognition now. And that's what we're trying to change that conception that, yes, in the past there were guys who didn't even know what they were selling you. But now you have to deal with people who are accredited, who are appropriately qualified to give you the right advice. And I think in an over-regulated market, it's very important that you get the right person. And that's why I keep saying financial doctor, because you, we go through board exams continuous professional development. Mm. So we are required to do just about everything which other professionals are expected to do. But unfortunately, this message hasn't quite touched the public. Hence, the book is a financial guide to ordinary people so that people start to uh, appreciate that there is someone actually who can help me with some of those hard money decisions. Most of the mistakes we make, we make alone because we don't know we can find help somewhere. In this financial plan and strategy that one comes up with, with the, the CFP uh, that might be involved, Gerald, number one, how do you find them and ensure that they are regulated and, uh, and it can meet uh, your, your needs as well as uh, uh, deliver on the promises that they might make? And secondly, how is it important is it to nurture that relationship? Because like you reflect in the group book, you grow up, you grow old, you go through certain life experiences, sometimes things happen, mm. you need insurance for this, uh, perhaps uh, in the broader prospect of things where issues like black tax still come up, you know, uh, ensuring mm. that uh, your CFP can apply to these Your needs. CFP professional is your doctor, so it's a relationship-based agreement so you need to have someone you trust someone you're comfortable with and you need to shop around just like most of us didn't take one gp and stick with them all our lives we tend to get referrals mm. get the best guy on the block we're all accredited and regulated under the face act which is the financial advisor and intermediary services act so it's legal and also the financial services board keeps an eye out we have to have professional qualification and accreditation with the financial planning institute of southern africa and uh, who are part of a global body so so it, it is happening i mean there are simply not enough cfp professionals out there yet but those who are there are not exactly complaining that they don't have enough work oh, you know so okay. so let's first utilize the supply which is out there and start taking control of this thing we call money because money is intergenerational and if you know the value of money, money is measured in time, mm. not, not in coins or in dollars or in rands or, or kwacha or whatever currency you're using. It's measured in time and as Africans we need to appreciate that. So one of the things I will be doing with the book is having a Kenyan edition and at least a Ghanaian edition with co-authors in those environments because this one was written obviously within a South African legal frame framework mm -hmm. and obviously if I engage a brother from Africa or a sister we can basically localize this book because the advice is the same. Let's start taking control of this money in a Western environment because this is an environment we didn't create for ourselves. True. So let's master it and be able to own it. I'm glad you mentioned that as well as uh, money and the value being created over time because we know that with uh, the emergence of this Western world as well as our own cultural practices, we still have things like stock files, which still perform very well for individuals as a method of saving as well as gathering money. Uh, as you mentioned, livestock mm. as well, uh, measured as a, a, an element of wealth creation. Can we actually merge ETFs uh, as well as an aggressive equity portfolio uh, together with the hedge fund, uh, with a stock fund and all these other uh, uh, yes, traditional means? Yes, I believe so. There's scope for agriculture futures, for livestock futures. We're Africans. Let's take the technology and the knowledge that is there in the world and bring it to our own values. What the problem is, is that we take things which we don't quite understand and we try and work with that. Let's work within our own African context, how we view value, how we value um, the exchange of money and create instruments which are uniquely African. I mm. see no problem in that. I think the technology is there. We just need the right minds around it. And in time, I believe that, that that's where we'll go. But the first message I just want everyone out there watching is that, do you have a money doctor? If you don't have someone who you call your wealth manager, sure. you have a problem because we buy and we make big decisions, cars, houses, investments, independently and we don't talk to anyone mm. find that one person who has all that knowledge who ties it all together and can keep an eye and help you out on this journey we call wealth creation because we certainly don't want to have the same journey our parents worked walked and that's why it's a journey it's about saying for us the first generation my rule is leave a house leave a trust leave no debt for your children that means your children start off at one level above where we started 
Otherwise, we stand up with a whole black tax environment yeah. where it's a self-perpetual cycle where we can't get out of it. And that's what we need to do. House, no debt, trust fund for each of your children. That's what you can do as a starting point. Well, Gerald, you certainly left a very high standard for today's uh, viewers. But let's, uh, however, get a quick recap on some of the key takeaway points that our viewers need to be cognizant of. <laughs> Well, Gerald, you've certainly left quite a high standard for a lot of our viewers today. But what are the key takeaway points, though, as we draw our conversation to a conclusion that viewers need to be cognizant of that are revealed in the book? In the book, I want you to remember that finances are planned. They're not accidents. No financial plan, you have financial accidents. If you have a doctor for your health, you need a financial doctor that's a CFE professional to help you. If there's none in your country, call me. Let's bring them there. Let's accredit them. Let's bring <laughs> that professionalism into the industry. There's some key mantras in the book as well. House before car. Mm. Make those big decisions in the right order because there's a purpose for that. Same thing with what you leave your children. Trust, a house, no debt. Set yourself those goals. Once you've achieved them, you can set higher goals. So obviously, there are those of us who achieve more. But let's start respecting money again and respecting ourselves in terms of how we treat money because money can be created wealth can be created africa is the future of the world in terms of wealth creation yeah. so i'm just hoping that i get brothers and sisters out there in africa we make this an african book and an african journey and start creating african instruments and african wealth I'm glad that you mentioned that. To close off with, we've certainly seen quite a lot of in individuals and investors trying to be so-called greedy, investing in returns of upwards of 30%, 50%, even 100% in some cases. Is there a manner in which one can have those ambitious views and take on risk, but still do so in a regulated environment? It's about risk. Anybody can take on risk, but if you understand the risk you're taking, it's up to you. And I think it's about treating people with that understanding that they've got the knowledge. At the moment, we don't. Mm. So let's start by reading the book, getting that knowledge, and then we can start having a risk appetite. Right now, we have risk greed and no one understanding what a risk appetite is. Sure, indeed. Mm. Cheryl, we'll leave it on that note, but clearly it's showing us to take ownership of our money, as the book says, my money. A uh, big thank you once more to our special guest this evening, Gerald Mwandiambira, who's a certified financial planner, as well as director of Sugar Creek Wealth, for joining us. You can get the book at uh, any of the uh, good bookstores out there in South Africa, or interact with us on Twitter, and we'll put you through in touch with the right channels uh, to uh, launch yourself into financial independence. Uh, it's been great being with you this evening, but until next time, it's goodbye for now.